But now something we mentioned, we mentioned energy, didn't mm. we there? Uh, a British reactor has broken the world record for the amount of energy made in a sustained fusion reaction. It's been hailed as a landmark in the quest for clean and renewable, uh, reliable power. How significant actually is this breakthrough? Well, Malcolm Grimston is a senior research fellow at Imperial College Centre of Energy Policy and Technology, as well as a very vocal ad advocate for nuclear energy. And he joins us now. Welcome to the programme. Um, first of all, uh, let's, let's, let's define our terms here. We know that nuclear power as it currently exists is about splitting the atom. Fission, nuclear fission. Nuclear fusion is about crashing atoms together to get even more power. Uh, why is that so much more difficult? Um, well, firstly, atoms don't like to be smashed together. They're positively charged, and positive charges uh, repel each other. So the closer you get to the two, it's basically different types of hydrogen that we're using, the simplest atom. But as we get them closer and closer together, they resist and resist and resist like fury. So you need extraordinary temperatures to get the... Uh, atoms moving quickly enough that they can actually approach each other and bash into each other, overcoming this natural sense of, of uh, repulsion, that uh, electrostatic repulsion, they call it. So you need to... Now, the sun is the our closest acting fusion reactor. That's so big, and the particles therefore inside are squashed together already by gravity, that it can run this around 10 million degrees C. It's a... Uh, uh, it, it's you know, a quite modest temperature, uh, not by our standards, of course. On Earth, we're doing it in, with much, much less material. So we need proportionally much higher uh, uh, temperatures up in the tens, hundreds of millions of degrees C. And that is a massive challenge because you can't put it in a bottle. Otherwise, it would just touch the sides and lose all its energy straight away. So what we've been doing through the Joint European Taurus, the project just near Oxford that you're talking about, over some decades now, is gradually getting more and more energy in to get more and more energy out. And this five-second pulse that they've just come up with is a real demonstration that the physics works. And this is about, because there's no, there's no metal, there's no sort of container that can hold something that's hotter than the sun. So this is about sort of getting a floating plasma, yeah. but magnets around sort of a, this, this thing that doesn't, that can't, it has to be very, very hot, but not touch anything, because it would burn straight <laughs> through it. Yeah, well, it's not so much that it would burn straight through it, because there isn't much stuff. It would just lose its energy. So we need what's called a magnetic bottle. Now, to make a magnetic field of that size, they've got four enormous flywheels, huge things, uh, that rotate very, very quickly, creating this magnetic field in which you can keep the plasmas, you're right, the, the word that's used, it's a different form of matter from the solid liquid gas that we used to. It's something that only happens at these very, very high temperatures. And you contain this within the magnetic bottle. Now, there's been some fascinating physics around this. For example, the plasma tries to worm its way out of the magnetic bottle. So you have to create a bottle that predicts this and blocks up the holes that the plasma will try to get out at. Now, what's happened is all of these issues have now been dealt with. The science is proven. That's actually just the beginning. Once you've shown you can do it scientifically, you then have to say, well, can we actually engineer a machine that will produce electricity? And that's where we are at the moment internationally. There's a project called ITER, the International Thermonuclear Experimental okay. Reactor, Ma being Ma built at the moment. We, we, we do have to, uh, to leave it there. It's been fascinating uh, speaking to you, but uh, Malcolm Grimston, it's Grimston there. I get there, so excited about this. I do apologize. <laughs> I can, no, well, I can I think sense we your enthusiasm. Do. I think we yeah. all do, but we need, to, we need to turn now from the science to yeah. the practicality. So we're on to our next guest, but Malcolm, thank you very much for joining us uh, there. Let's talk about what this means for us sitting at home, what yeah. it means for our pocket and for our energy um, with Andy Meyer from the Institute of Economic Affairs. Um, well, kicking off, we've seen that that's science proof. When, when, might, when might this be producing energy? Well, I think everybody's right to get excited, um, but I'm probably going to have to curb that enthusiasm a little bit by talking about what this really means. And fusion typically is about 15 to 50 years away from commercial reality. What's happened with the experiment in December is we can now say it's 14 to 49 years away and still uncertain in terms of its commercial viability.
So one of the ways this gets reported sometimes is people say this is brilliant. We can have a clean, green form of nuclear power in the future that's too cheap to meter. It repeats the mistake that was made in the 1950s when fission power was first being discussed. That's not the reality. The reality from the best estimates we've seen so far is that it's going to cost about the same as conventional nuclear, but it is better. It is safer. It doesn't have the same problem of safety. Why would it be so much more expensive if it's so much more powerful? Well, the issue is not so much the technology as how you get the energy into it and the energy out of it at the other side. Now, both elements that are expensive, about a third of the cost of a tokamak, which is the reactor that's down in France. That's a good will word. Will be the next stage. Oh, it's brilliant. There's loads of brilliant words in this. There's Q values, all sorts of fun stuff. But the cost comes in how you get the energy in and out. So the thing in France that's supposed to go live in 2025 isn't going to be putting any energy into the grid. It's just another experiment. Mm. So at the earliest, you'd say this is something that might be happening in the 2030s if they can make it viable. And these are, these are sort of big sort of uh, donuts, mm -hmm. if we like, that have this, this ring of plasma that circles around through them. And so far, every single one that we've built has needed more energy in than we've got out. But, but that could change. Well, that is what's changing. So the, the Oxford experiment wasn't quite at parity. And when they're reporting that the energy in wasn't quite at the same level as the energy out, it's a little misleading because it's missing out all those other stages. So they think to get it to commercial reality, it needs to extract about 40 times the energy that's put into it in the core reaction, mm -hmm. taking into account all those other things. Yeah, and when it comes to clean and renewable energy, obviously we know the government's agenda. They've been very clear about uh, their net zero agenda. But we have lots of viewers getting in touch all the time saying, I didn't sign up for this, although it was in, in their manifesto. But what do you, do you think the government has it right at the moment in terms of its energy policy, particularly given the costs that, some, that many people in this country are going to face in, in the drive towards net zero? Oh, absolutely not. I mean, the fundamental error the government's made is by abandoning pragmatism and taking an ideological approach such that with net zero, it's not so much that it's wrong in terms of what is needed to stop the progress of climate change. It's the ideological obsession with opposing absolutely anything that has carbon emissions coming from it in the interim. So what we need at the moment is a far more pragmatic approach. We need to start drilling again in the North Sea. We need to start fracking again to provide the backup for this growing mm. renewable power that's coming onto the grid. And also, as transition yeah. fuels as we, move, as we move towards that renewable future. I'm afraid we're running to the end of the programme there, but Andy, thank you so much for coming in. It's so useful to get those two different Absolutely. sides of the thing, the science and the practicality.